Uh, we're here with uh, Jeannie Ives of Wheaton. She's a candidate for Congress in the Republican primary for the 6th Congressional District. Uh, wanted to just ask you some questions. We try to formulate an endorsement in this race. Uh, we'll start with a, a general one. Could you please just introduce yourself to us and tell us why you're running for Congress? Sure. Uh, I'm Jeannie Ives. I'm a resident of Wheaton. I've lived there for 28 years where my husband and I have raised our five children. My background is that I graduated from West Point with an economics degree, served six years in the military, and then uh, stayed at home to uh, take care of my kids. Meanwhile, I did some tax and bookkeeping work on the side. So I got involved in politics first at the Wheaton City Council level over a tax issue, of course. And I realized very quickly that if you want to protect taxpayers, you have to go to Springfield and do something about them because they have the heavy hand of government is in Springfield that basically regulates everything that the municipalities can do on taxes, quite frankly, and uh, what the state does. So I went to Springfield, served six years, and I went there to defend the taxpayer who does, has the smallest voice possible in any committee hearing or on the House floor. And so, you know, when I served the minority, by the way, while, while I was down there. So any legislation I passed, I had to get through in a bipartisan way. So some of my biggest significant accomplishments down there was, first of all, taking on corruption, which I did with the College of DuPage issue. And I don't know if you covered it, but it was a huge issue in DuPage. Uh, one scandal after another, one misspent tax dollar after another. And I was the lead legislator on cleaning that up. Uh, not to mention, I was also the catalyst for, for getting that all thing, the whole ball rolling as well. So uh, worked on that issue, passed, the, passed bipartisan legislation that really became the, uh, the template for further legislative action to rein in uh, severance contracts at colleges and also uh, contracts in general, just what they could pay out, uh, how long they could be. So worked on that. Then I worked on uh, another significant bill that I worked bipartisanly on is the network adequacy bill. This is a bill that allowed uh, that requires that uh, providers of health care and insurance companies must have an adequate uh, uh, network or adequate uh, provisions to take care of people all across the state. So they can't have a narrow uh, segmentation of who they want to in their network. They've got to actually expand it with the right specialists so that the entire state is covered with people that are able to provide the care that's necessary. So I started that bill and ended up uh, being a bipartisan bill that was passed unanimously. So really thrilled about that legislation. Uh, I also took, I stood with the women on the sexual harassment uh, issue as well. And then things started to happen, you know, and we saw some of the, the legislation that Bruce Rauner passed that I absolutely disagreed with on a policy front. And so we ran for governor at that point. Me, me the team, we, we came together, a lot of us, and said, you know what, we want to go a different direction. So we ran for governor, and um, you know, I could not, at that time, also run for the state rep seat that I was holding at that same time. So I l left office in 2019. And I'll tell you what, I am not satisfied with the representation that the 6th Congressional District has had since Sean Kasten took over. And when you look at the fact that nothing has gotten done, since Nancy Pelosi took over and that their entire goal was to impeach President Trump and that they've gotten nothing done on health care uh, affordability, on bringing down drug prices. They really have not gotten anything done on that, that their whole goal was to impeach President Trump and upend his presidency. When you look at that, you know, understand that there's been a disservice. Additionally, when you look at where the Democrat Party wants to go from their presidential candidates on down, you can understand that that is not the direction that America should go. We are about freedom and opportunity and choice for people. We are not about government control over people's businesses and lives. And so it became imperative that if my kids, your kids, if the future of America really wants to have the same sort of opportunities we've had in the past, that you've got to change out the politicians. So I, that's why I'm running for, for this, uh, this seat. We do not like the direction that the Democrats are taking us. We don't believe in their big government ideas and massively more taxes to fund those. We believe that you should be represented and not ruled over by a political elites. Look, Sean Caston has voted 100% of the time with Nancy Pelosi. She represents San Francisco. There's no way in, uh, possible that 100% of the votes that align with Nancy Pelosi also line up with the 6th Congressional District that is centered here in, in the western suburbs of Chicago. So we're here to represent the people just like I did in Congress. By the way, the bills that I highlighted in my, in my uh, state rep career, they came from the constituents that I served. I took their ideas and their, their issues and I wrote them into a bill format 
and I got them to come down and testify on their legislation and we got changes made. That's what a representative does. They represent you, they don't rule over you. So I'm looking forward to uh, this election. Uh, we're just excited to be running and, and uh, hopefully we, we, we plan on being victorious in 2020 and moving on. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, President Trump took office with a goal to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, which it didn't happen, but the health care law has been stripped of several provisions and the administration has backed away from defending it in court. Would you vote to rep re repeal the Affordable Care Act and what, if anything, would you replace it with? I, I would vote to repeal the, the Affordable Care Act, but let's be honest here. There, the Obamacare doesn't really exist in its, in its, first form, its original form, as you just stated. They got rid of the uh, individual mandate. They got rid of uh, the tax on medical devices. They got rid of the tax on plans that are, um, you know, Cadillac plans. Uh, so they've gotten rid of all of that. Uh, and at the same time, they've offered a number of waivers to states who want to need, need to create their own programs outside of Obamacare's mandates so that they can serve their most needy. So they're called 1332 waivers, and I think it's something like well over 30 states have requested a 1332 waiver so that they can create, again, their, their plans that take care of those with um, pre-existing needs or uh, risks that are greater than the population. So wholesale, the Obamacare does not exist in its permanent form. So whether we repeal it just as a show of like, you know what, we're, we're stripping everything away from that and we're starting fresh, um, we're getting back to where we were before with at least you can keep your private health insurance. So there's two things going on here. One, again, the Democrats want to lead us in an entirely different direction, and that includes Sean Caston. He has a multi-step way to actually lead to single payer. He has said he's okay with people buying into Medicare. He has said that he agrees with universal health care. Sean Caston has said that you are greedy if you don't want to pay more taxes for universal health care. So he wants government control over your choices, over your family's health care, and he wants you to pay massively more taxes to fund that. We fundamentally disagree with that as the route. On the other hand, there's ways that we can bring down costs. And I think Trump is on the right path in terms of saying, look, we need price transparency. Above all else, we need price transparency. And while that doesn't mean that somebody like me, whose son, my son broke his leg last year, it was a $56,000 bill. Great, he got great care, top-notch surgeon, all of that. I didn't price shop that, so, because guess what, I'm not really the end payer. We had great insurance, and I'm so appreciative of having that employer-based insurance. So it's employers who need the price transparency so that they can help drive down market costs. And so I think transparency brings a lot to people who are self-insured, uh, run businesses that are self-insured, people on the individual market, who want insurance companies to help get them a better price. So price transparency is very important to us. Uh, that includes drug price transparency. That would help solve some, allevi alleviate some of the problems that we have. It includes allowing individuals who, who are purchasing insurance themselves that they have the same tax preferred benefits that you have as an employer, that you can fully deduct that premium on the front side of your, your tax return and not on the back side um, under uh, the deductions to pays. So we're all in for that. We think uh, offering more health savings accounts and giving them better um, metrics to, to work with, we think that's an important thing. We think associations coming together so that they can pool their, their employees and get a better pricing on insurance, that's a good thing. So everything is moving in that direction where you open up the market to competition. And we know this has worked in, you name it, the cell phone industry, the TV industry, you name it, when you have better pricing, more open, uh, better competition, uh, you get better quality at a lower cost. So we need to do the same thing. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about another federal issue that uh, you think is important to voters in the 6th District and how you'd address it. Well, we think uh, tax and, and budget are important. And in fact, that's one of our top things as well. Look, you cannot continue to ha add trillion dollar deficits on people long term. That it does nobody well. And Illinoisans should know that better than anyone. I mean, you know, in Illinois, we haven't had a balanced budget since 2001. We have the worst credit rating because that we have massive amounts of debts. We have 600% uh, of our, our income in debt. It doesn't serve us well. The state is literally uh, bankrupt, um, you know, and so is Chicago. Uh, 
So can we get back from that brink? I don't know, but you know, for the federal government to hold that much debt as well, it does not serve its people well long term. At some point, you know, the next crisis, the next recession, when you have literally at now at this point, you have the debt service obligation at the federal government approaching the amount of money that we spend on defense. So it's going to crowd out everything else that you need to spend money on just like it has in the state of Illinois. We know how bad that is. So I'd like to put in budget caps. We had them before, and with the first vote in 2019 on a budget, they blew through the caps and spent $340 billion more than we were going to take in. Uh, the tax cuts brought in 4% more in revenue. The problem is those 2017 tax cuts were effective in bringing in more revenue because you lowered the corporate rate, you got actually more taxes to come back mm -hmm. and not be hidden offshore. The problem is they spent 8% 8, 8 more than they did the year before. Now, did, does anybody feel like they got a benefit from 8% more of federal spending in your individual life? I, I don't see it. I honestly have not seen it. So I, I think we need to prioritize the budget. We need budget caps. Um, and, we, and we need to, over time, bring down that deficit so we have the flexibility in the future to service the things that we need to service, whether it's a coronavirus, problem that comes up, a, na a natural disaster like a tornado in Tennessee, um, or you know, actually providing for the infrastructure needs that we need, especially in the 6th Congressional District. Gotcha. So that would be another topic. I mean, there's multiple ones. Sure, but, of course, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, here's one. Uh, Congress has been criticized for a failure to deliver any meaningful reforms to our immigration system. Uh, what, how would you describe your position on immigration, and what reforms do you support, if any? So I, I feel like with immigration that we've kind of, um, you know, we, we haven't positioned ourselves very well to be truth tellers that we're going to fix immigration uh, and, and we're going to secure the border. So the first step really at this point is to secure the border. I think that's where we should be in securing the border. How that looks like, I'm going to leave it up to the experts. In some cases, a wall works. In some cases, it's uh, zoned surveillance or, or um, other means of electronic surveillance. In some cases, it's more border patrol agencies. Certainly, it's more control about visa overstays and em employers making sure that there's E-Verify where you know exactly who you're employing. And I think it's only fair, it's really only fair to the American people that, that we allow people in legally and not illegally. Illegality breeds all sorts of other illegality down the road. And it's not fair for our citizens to be, uh, you know, taken advantage of by uh, criminal illegal aliens, which is one subset of illegal immigration that we need to deal with. You know, Kim Fox just let out an illegal immigrant uh, who had uh, actually been deported, came back, and he's the one who just assaulted a three-year-old, yeah. sexually assaulted him. He should have been, and he, they had a detainer on him and they refused to operate with him. This idea that we're gonna have sanctuaries from laws what what other law should we have a sanctuary for? It's nonsense. We are a nation of laws. We are not a nation of men making up which laws they want to defend or prosecute. We are a nation of laws. And when you lose that, you really lose what it's like to be an American. And it starts at the border. It does, it really does. So we need to have border security and then we, we need to have, you know, we can talk about immigration reform after that. But the first step is border security visa overstays, E-Verify, and then, you know, I'm all for legal immigration. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, would, I support that, and I support our asylum laws as well, as well, especially when they have, when we've had foreign foreigners who have helped our protect and defend and save our troops in, on overseas battlefields, those folks who find their lives threatened by Al-Qaeda or other terrorists, they deserve to come over here if they want to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as, as do uh, people who want to serve in our military. Of course. Mm -hmm. um, so the last time this seat was contested, the, the state and local tax cap that was included yes. in President Trump's tax reform, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, was a hot button issue. Uh, do you agree with that that state and local tax cap as it's, it's currently construed or should, if not, would you work to repeal or raise that cap? Well, let's start at the beginning here. First of all, the reason that Illinoisans have high property taxes has nothing to do with the federal government. That your high property tax bill has everything to do with the dysfunction in the state. From the school spending and how they, they work that in, 
to just multiple units of government siphoning off a little bit at a time to really um, uh, public sector unions who get everything they want and more in every collective bargaining uh, thing and then do do so without transparency. I mean, we Absolutely. talked prior to this thing. I mean, that's all the, those are true. Though but... they are true. No, so I'll yes, get to the yes. point. But so let's uh, the idea that your property tax bill is a problem with the federal government is not true. Your property tax bill is a product of Illinois government, mm -hmm. and so that's one thing. Now, the salt cap at ten thousand dollars is pretty generous when you look across any other state. It's not generous in a state like Illinois that has the highest tax burden per taxpayer. So would I, the question really is, is would I put in legislation to raise it? Because certainly Sean Cast and Underwood did that. But I, yeah, I'm absolutely for, if we want to raise the salt cap to $15,000, I would sign on to that legislation and vote for it. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the issue is, if they're going to put in legislation like that, it's not going to be a one single, uh, single item bill. They're going to ask for something in return. It's what do they want in return? If they're going to go back and say, well, now we're going to raise the corporate tax rate, you know, 4% to 25%, guess what? I'm not okay with that. Mm -hmm. We need to have a competitive corporate tax rate. Yeah. And for sure, they're going to have to figure out something on that end. But do, do I want to protect us? Absolutely, because I understand we're a donor state. I, I get yeah, that. that you know, I'm from a donor. I'm, I'm from a donor county, quite frankly, to, to, the, to the rest of Illinois. We understand that we're taxed a tremendous amount and we receive very little back in return. Yeah. So I, I get that, not to mention we have lots of big infrastructure needs and we need those funded. So uh, I want to get us that money back. Um, and that so. was, I mean, that was what I was, I kind of wanted to bring mm -hmm. up is, you know, this is a donor state. And Absolutely. There are a lot of more sparsely populated states that reap a lot more federal benefits uh, than the state of Illinois. Um, and then they have low local property taxes and, and everybody says, well, what a great example. Uh, you know, and I guess that's, that's, that's something that people often bring up when mm -hmm. I bring up. Uh, the salt cap issue. Uh, so, do you, I mean, is it fair to say that the federal government has nothing to do with the fact that so much of our tax revenue for local government operations is is state based? Yeah, you cannot make the argument that it's anything other than Illinois' dysfunction. Mm -hmm. uh, honestly, on the high, high property taxes, we're number two. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, USA Today just did a study. If you follow my social media, I posted it with multiple comments beneath it because one. We're number two after New Jersey on property tax burden, right? Yeah. We're over 2%. There are, um, there are only 22 states. Well, there's only three states, only three states. Ill, um, uh, New Jersey, Illinois, New Hampshire that have over a 2% effective tax rate. Only three states. Only 22 states have a tax rate, effective tax rate higher than 1%. So, <laughs> Well over half of the states have effective tax rates below 1%. Some of those are very, very big states, and some of those are states that have no income tax. So our tax structure, which I've always argued for as a, as a state rep, absolutely should be looked at mm -hmm. holistically. And, and it's the same thing at the federal government. You do have to look at these things holistically and understand who's a donor state, who's not a donor state, what are they getting in terms of Medicaid funding or food stamps or, or whatever else. I mean, you do have to parse that out. I understand that, mm -hmm. which is why I would vote on a single issue to, to raise it, but you'd have to find out what they'd want in return. So this um, this is a, a, a quality race for the 6th Congressional District. I'd say that both of the candidates are very impressive. You both have um, very impressive resumes, both yourself and your opponent. Uh, you have a lot of experience. You've been out there fighting. He's he's a surgeon. I mean, he's um, you know he he's definitely a person that that uh, merits some respect as well. Why are you the best person to face Sean Cast in November? There's multiple reasons. One, I do have a long policy knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, when my my Republican opponent was running for state rep, um, I came in and gave him lots of policy advice because he did not know anything about what was happening in Springfield. Mm -hmm. So I sat with him multiple times to give him policy advice. And it's very, very important since I served at the local level, I served at the state level. Uh, and, I, and I was a, a, a voracious reader and somebody who was outspoken about the, the, the topics. And, and so to do that, I had to know what I know. Um, I, think, I think my, I bring a big background in understanding how that all fits together. So that's number one. Number two, that let, let's, let's be honest with you. 
there's a lot of backbenchers, aren't there, in politics? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of backbenchers who will just follow the leadership, vote the way the leadership wants to, uh, won't s speak up in committee, won't take on the arguments, don't want to be called names, you know, mm -hmm. won't actually represent the people. Because look, you can get, you can get away with it doing practically nothing, especially as a state rep. And then you can go back to your district, tell your people what you want them to hear and not tell them the whole story. That's not how I was. And people who know me and watch me, they know that's not how I was. Because it takes a lot of political courage to get up there and defend your arguments and make reasoned arguments and do the research so that you know what you know. And to ask the tough questions when the superintendent the superintendent's sitting in front of you in committee and you say to them, well, you can't have a fair school funding formula if you don't change the assessment process on property taxes because it's foundational to the funding formula. And I'm getting into the weeds here. So your viewers, I'm getting into the weeds here, but it's important for you to understand. So the superintendent standing in front of you and like, how can you even advocate for a fair funding formula on education when you know the starting point is how the property is assessed and you know that it is messed up and the superintendent finally admits well, you're right about that, Representative Ives, because, you know, in our county, we haven't done a reassessment of property for 35 years. It happened. Hmm. It happened. But most people don't have the courage to actually question the superintendent and then actually know the questions to ask. So I, 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 I said, I, well, thank you for being honest. And then I immediately sent a letter to Illinois Department of Revenue, and sure enough, they had not done a reassessment for over 30 years. And that superintendent sat there for 25 years and knew that it wasn't being reassessed property and never said a word. Never said a word. Nobody in the county board said a word. Nobody in the municipality said a word. All the assessors, nobody said a word. And so I, they never said a word. So my point is, is that political courage is not something that you see in everybody. And in these days and age, you have to have two things. One, you have to have you have to have the intellectual curiosity to want to know what is the right solution. What's the right way to solve this problem? I honestly think there's really, it's not, good legislation is not really red or blue. It is just good legislation. You can't destroy your businesses and expect to have tax revenue that doesn't bleed out over to across state lines. You can't do that. It doesn't serve anybody well. It's the same thing with education. You can't put in a bunch of mandates or, or, um, or, or you can't, um, you know, just spend fruitlessly on, on education and not expect something in return because it doesn't serve the, 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 the student well. So you have to have intellectual curiosity. You have the political courage to say what needs to be said and stand up for your constituents. And you got to be able to be independent to some extent. And I think, you know, the, I took on both parties against unbalanced budgets and tax hikes. You can check my record. And so I think that that's really the difference maker. I've seen too many people that I have personally supported into office only to be let down by them just taking a leadership vote on really bad policy. From the Exxon bailout bill to just green energy th subsidies that make no sense in a coal, natural gas, nuclear state. Uh, so, I mean, I just time and again, so I think that that is really kind of the difference maker. I care about getting the policy right and I will, and oh, I guess the last thing is really, I've worked bipartisanly to pass really good legislation because I owed it to the people I represented to take every idea um, seriously and, 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 then, and, and, and then make sure that I was not going to, um, I'm missing something simply because the other person has a D behind their name. And so I did, I did that. Any other issues you'd like to discuss while you're here? Um, I don't know. Do you, do you have anything? <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. No. I've, I've definitely appreciated you.